Maybe what I'll do just for drill as an introduction to my little dog and pony show here is to do the demonstration with uh, this um great. Oh. All right, it might be good. That's not made for what this uh, what this is is an antenna simulator. Okay, it acts like an antenna, and um, actually it's the same circuit as an antenna, a simple antenna like a dipole or a vertical or something like that. And uh, uh, what it does is um, I put the analyzer on. Uh, oh, you're. Uh, oh, okay. Here, how's that? That's great. And then we'll put this in there. Picture two. How's that? Does that work? Anyway, what I can do here, uh, I'll get around the backside here. <laughs> um, um, if I tune the resonant frequency, the antenna simulator to the analyzer, it dips just like an antenna in SWR. And so in this case it goes down to, oh, what was that? Um, it's about 1.2 to 1 or something like that. It should go farther than that, but you can see where it is. Uh, or I can tune the analyzer. And uh, is it 4.60 or something? <coughs> and I can break it down. There. Or I can uh, go up to about here. <coughs> and now I'll. Uh, There. Now let's see, let's move this a little bit here. Right. So 6.8, you're a little out of band there on that tuning, don't you? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I'll get a pink ticket. <laughs> now you notice that um, on this frequency, the SWR went right down to 1 to 1. And the reason for that is the ratio of the inductance to the capacitance that resonates at that frequency, like the LC ratio, okay? It has to do with the impedance of the resulting resonant impedance. Uh, today we're going to talk about simple antennas which are like end fed wires, center fed dipoles, you know, verticals, and these are all series resonant radio circuits, simple. A capacitor, a resistor, an inductor, and a source of RF, which is your transmitter. And the transmitter itself actually acts like a charge pump. It's a charge pump. Now, if you can imagine two tanks of water, then you got a pipe that runs between them. And in that pipe, you've got a piston that you can pull back and forth. So when you pull the piston, piston one way, it, it push, pulls water out of one tank, and it pushes water in the other tank. So the tanks go like this, when the piston goes this way. Or if you push the piston the other way, like that, water goes up like that, right? And that's what transfer is the charge pump. And what you're doing is you're moving charges that consist of groups of electrons. Lots of electrons. To give you an example, um, an ampere is uh, 6.23 times 10 to the 26 electrons per second going past the point. 10 to the 26 power is 26 zeros. Lots of electrons, right? Real small. Now, one of the properties of electrons is they hate each other. Okay? 
They don't want to stay together. They want to spread apart. And when you try to force them together, that force field goes up and up and up. The pressure increases. And so a high voltage, by definition, definition voltage is like electric pressure, right? Occurs because the electrons are trying to expand. And one way you create a flow of electrons <coughs> is to take a conductor and strip electrons off one end. And that means there's more electrons over here than there are over here. So what do these guys do? They expand to fill up the space, right? <coughs> and so if I pump them back and forth, then here I got this conductor and I'm pumping the electrons back and forth. When I pump this way, a whole bunch of them build up on this end, and the voltage gets high, positive, and I come down, and it gets low over here, and if I pump in the other way, it gets high here, low over there. And when those electrons move, they create a magnetic field. Okay? That's how a motor works. Electrons move through a wire, create a magnetic field, interacts with a piece of steel, moves the steel, because the steel is magnetic, right? So one of the things I want to do here really fast is I want to quickly define a few terms so that we're all kind of on the same page. We've already talked about electrons, and we've talked about charge being a group, a group of electrons. We talked about voltage being the attempt by the electrons to spread apart, or it's the difference in potential between here and here, where I've got a lot of electrons here and none here, and they all want to go over here if they can. And uh, so we've talked about conductors, and the electrons hop along the outside of the atoms in the conductor, and there, there are more electrons in the, in the conductor than there are holes formed in the atoms. So there are a lot of electrons that are just accumulated, like on the surface. So if I pull on the electrons on one end of that conductor, they start to spread down and even out again. That's the flow of current. All right, now, if the material um, has a limited number of opportunities for electrons to flow, it's harder for them to flow. It takes more voltage pull them through the conductor. And an analogy for that is, you're on the freeway, and it's rush hour, there's six lanes of traffic, everybody's doing 90, 90 miles an hour, right? Yeah. And somebody has a wreck up there. And the next thing you know, you're down to one lane. And all those cars got to go through, pass into that one lane to get by the wreck. What does it do to the flow rate? It slows it down. That's called resistance, electrical resistance. Same thing going on there. Okay, so now we've talked about a resistance, and um, there was a man who quantitized the relationship between current voltage and, re and, and resistance, and he came up with this concept called the ohm. And he said, well, if I have a certain amount of voltage, and uh, uh, they came up with an equation E equals IR, or V equals IR, right? So the voltage is proportional to the current times the resistance it's going through, right? That's Ohm's law. And that was this guy's name. Well, in electronics, like everywhere else, we got all these words and definitions we have to deal with, words that mean things that enable you to do calculations because behind the whole scene there it's a mathematical field we have to be able to do calculations to figure things out so we end up with terms like voltage right and we end up with current in amperes ampere was the guy's name they figured out the ampere right volt came from volta right and he built a battery <laughs> yes that makes sense you know hertz he was the guy that discovered radio, right? So Hertz says, now a megacycle is a million 
uh, megahertz is a million cycles per second. And so there are all these names, and they all have a mathematical description to them of how they're used in equations. And so behind all the whole thing, there are all these equations that describe and uh, identify and calculate all these properties of radio. And so here we are today, we're talking about antennas, and what we're going to talk about antennas has to do mostly with uh, wavelength, it has to do with frequency in hertz, it has to do with inductance in henrys or micro henrys or whatever it is, it has to do with uh, farads, microfarads and capacitors, right? Well, what's a capacitor? Well, a capacitor holds the charge. It's like a jar of honey, right? The electrons in the honey, and they're in the jar. And so, uh, the more electrons you can cram into the jar, the higher the voltage across the, the, the two plates, because that's what a capacitor is. It's two plates of metal, and uh, I pump electrons with an electron pump from one side to the other. I deplete one side of electrons, I put a lot of electrons on the other side, and the voltage between those two plates gets real high. Well, an interesting thing about a capacitor that nobody thinks about is, I cannot deposit more charge in a capacitor than there are free electrons in the metal. Because that's where they come from. Electrons are coming off this plate, going over onto this plate, almost like charging a battery when it's not a battery. And so, in the case of an inductor, what is an inductor? Well, we talked about a, a conductor, a wire, and we ran current through the wire, it generated a magnetic field. Now, what's a magnetic field? Who knows? <coughs> it's a magnetic field. It's a phenomenon we can detect. We're not sure what it is, right? And just, uh, unfortunately, that's the truth. But we know that if you create a magnetic field, and you are uh, changing magnetic field, and you put a wire in it, a voltage appears across the ends of the wire. Well, it's a generator, right? Or if I take and uh, I run a current through a wire, it generates a magnetic field that expands out into space around that wire. And as soon as the current goes away, it collapses and makes a great big high voltage on the wire for just a second. All right, so now we're going to talk about antennas. And uh, there's two parts to my little dog and pony show. First we talk about the dogs, then we talk about the ponies, okay? <laughs> but um, the first part is just a general discussion about, um, about antenna theory. And uh, I've got a whole bunch of pictures I want to have here for you to show you what's going on. And um, um, now, if I took a piece of wire, and my arms are real strong, I took a piece of wire about that long, and I threw it up into space, and it tumbles up into space and goes into orbit around the Earth or floats off somewhere, that piece of wire is automatically, by definition, a dipole. It's a dipole. It's an antenna. That's a simple antenna. They don't get simpler than that. Okay? So now, here's my wire tumbling in space. And it's, by definition, it's half a wavelength long. Now what does that mean? That means, in one cycle, in a cycle of current flow, and half of that cycle, the electrons from this end are going to move to this end. And they do that in half cycle, and the other half cycle, they move back to here. And the ones from this end come down here. And this charge in the wire, consisting of the electrons on the surface of the wire, the surplus electrons, is going to move back and forth from end to end in that wire and make a complete orbit every cycle. Well, where do these signals come from? Well, space is filled with radio signals. So I just throw the wire out there 
and I guarantee you it has signals on it. And one, one uh, range of frequencies is a such that for that frequency, the wire is a half wavelength long. And those signals will be uh, uh, collected more than signals of different frequencies because they resonate with that wire, which is acting like a tuned circuit, and it's storing energy. Okay, so now, here's my wire, and I've got some other drawings here. Um, here's the voltage for half a cycle. It's uh, positive over here, negative over here. And the, this here uh, is the current flow, and you see the highest current flow is right in the center of the antenna because, oh. Top center button, sir. Right there. Oh. Oh, all right. All right. Well, advanced technology in action. <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> now I'm in good shape. Anyway, so, oh. Which way? Which way? What do you mean? Oh, here we go. All right. So uh, here's our halfway wire. And um, on half of the cycle, the uh, half of the cycle, we got a high voltage on this end, a positive, negative voltage on this end, a vertical <coughs> being up being positive, down being negative. And so when it's high here, uh, positive, the electrons want to move down to this end. And so we're gathering up all the electrons, and uh, most of the electrons are right here in the center. So the when we gather them all up, we get a whole bunch of them going across the center. But they get down to the end, they've got no place to go. They're, they're stopped right here, okay? And so when it gets down there, and when they all get down there, the polarity is going to change. It's going to be negative down here because all the electrons are here. And then it gets to be positive over here, and they all rush back to the other end. And they sit there, and they oscillate back and forth. Okay, now... The electron density is going to be highest on the ends when it's uh, positive, negative, uh, pulls all the electrons down this end positive. There's a lot of electrons here, but by the center there are almost none. The ones that are down here are able to move this far in half a cycle, and so they're all down here. But actually, it looks more like this. I'm just showing you, relatively speaking, where all those electrons have moved, how they've moved, you see. So, you get down here, you look at this one, and this curve is, is telling you that when it's positive, all of, most are down here, least are here. When it's negative, uh, it's the opposite. They're mostly down here, and just a few of them there, and they oscillate back and forth every cycle. All right, now, the interesting thing about that is, let's go to the uh, next illustration. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, here's our wire floating in space again, up here. And it's got current going through it. We, down here, I've got a center-fed dipole hooked to a charge pump. And on half the cycle, the charge pump pulls electrons in like this, they go through the charge pump and they go down to this end here. On the next half of the cycle, it's going to reverse and it's going to pump them the other way. And that's all the farther they flow. The ones from here flow to here, the ones from here flow to here, and these uh, that are flowing through here are replacing the ones that are going up in that direction there and vice versa. And we create a magnetic field around there as a result of these current flow, and that magnetic field sets up a magnetic, electromagnetic wave in space, and that wave propagates out, and it goes over to this other wire here, and induces a current flow in that wire. Now, that's our dipole, it doesn't have anything hooked to it, but it's got this current circulating back and forth in it, like we already talked about. So actually, there's a, a buildup of energy 
in this antenna over here, and it's this the only dissipation that's got the only way it has to escape is to turn into heat. So this thing will warm up, and all that radio energy, part of it gets re-radiated re back into space, and then part of it gets dissipated as heat. Now an interesting thing you can do with this, if you had a mountain peak like this, right? And you got a radio transmitter over here, and a receiver over here on the other side of the mountain peak, or mountain range, you could put a wire up there, and the signal from that transmitter would hit the wire, and the wire would rebroadcast it down on this side. And they actually do things like that. So uh, anyway, so here we have uh, added a source that is producing this oscillating field of the antenna. And that's this next picture. So now we go to, we're going to go back and just look at the wire as a circuit element. It's, a, it's an electronic circuit. It's a complete electronic circuit all by itself. And it consists of the wire has inductance, and I can draw the wire as a series of coils, just like the little coil here, coil wire here. I've only got a whole bunch of them, and they're all in series. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. That's the length of the wire, and it has inductance like a whole series of little coils. Now, the wire also has capacity. It acts like a capacitor. This end is different than that end. So if I have a high voltage here and a low voltage here, that high voltage electrostatic field gets coupled to this end through space. And this is the part of the antenna you don't see. There's all this, these capacitors that are coupling energy, electrostatic uh, fields, across this wire from one end to the other. And each one of these is acting like a little series, a little radio resonant circuit, a whole bunch of them. And you add a whole bunch of these little resonant circuits together, and guess what it does? It drops the frequency. And so um, this thing is an, is an oscillator. And this is the schematic for that oscillator. And I could actually put a source of energy across here and make an oscillator out of it, you know, or an amplifier or something, and it's the same thing going on. But there's just a, what's going on in a piece of wire. Okay, so now we get to the... Now, <clears throat> one of the things I want to mention here, uh, while we're on the subject, uh, can we go back to that previous one for just a minute? Okay. <laughs> I got ahead of my own notes. <laughs> I got to talk about another word. It's called isotropic. How do you like that one? It's Greek, okay? And iso means way, right? And tropic means the same, okay? So the word isotropic means the same way. And what it's referring to is out in space. If I was to take any kind of measurement in space, right, it doesn't matter which direction I take that measurement, it's the same properties. So space has, is isotropic, it has the same properties in every direction. So if I put an antenna in space, uh, then it becomes an isotropic antenna, and it behaves in space differently than it would close to the Earth because it gets close to the Earth, it interacts with the Earth. But out in space, it's got nothing to interact with. And so lots of times they talk about isotropic radiators, and what they're talking about is an antenna in an environment that is not influenced by anything else. Okay? We don't have that situation here on Earth. Okay, now we can go to the next one. Uh, there, that's the one. And uh, we have the antenna near Earth. Well. We got this same piece of wire that we threw out in space, now it's close to the Earth, and so uh, due to the fact that the Earth has a lot of electrons in it, it's made of atoms, and it has a lot of free electrons, uh, and it responds to charge, 
density, differences in charge density, electron current travel through the earth, through the material of the earth, not as well as a conductor, but it, it happens. And this wire becomes capacitively coupled to the earth. You see, because it's a conductor, the earth's a conductor, they're isolated from each other by some distance that is insulating them, but they interact electrostatically like this. And so when we bring this antenna down here close to the earth, it had a certain resonant frequency in space that was a result of how fast the electrons can move back and forth from end to end. That determines the, how long the antenna is for a given frequency. All right, now, when we bring the antenna down close to Earth, we increase the capacity across this inductor. And that when we increase the capacity, it drops the resonant frequency. And so, if you cut an antenna uh, using the formula 468 over F, that gives you the, uh, a half wave in, in uh, English system, you know, inches and feet, or actually in feet, uh, that antenna will have uh, be at a lower frequency than it would be in space. And so they have a chart in your antenna books that tells you how much uh, length shortening it takes on an antenna to get the same frequency at a given distance above the ground. That's what that chart is all about. And if you've seen that chart, it goes like this. The higher you get in the air, the less impact the Earth is having on it. And that impact relates to the height of the antenna in quarter waves. Because there's energy coming from the antenna, and it bounces off the ground and goes back, interferes with the antenna. And uh, so anyway, so here's what happens when you put uh, what the resonant circuit for antenna looks like close to the ground. Okay, so now the next one we do, here is... Uh, uh, sir? Yep. <laughs> there you go. That's okay. Anyway, now we have our half wave wire close to the earth, and I've gone down here and I put a charge pump on the end of it. Okay? This is like an end fed wire antenna. And probably with modern transmitter, this thing would actually consist of an antenna coupler and a transceiver or transmitter or something. Uh, to match the impedance at the end. But anyway, there's a schematic diagram for it, and you see what's happening is the transmitter is pulling on this end and pumping electrons down this way, half a cycle, and then it's pulling on the other way, it's pulling the electrons out of the ground and pushing them on the wire on the other half of the cycle. So we can see the red arrows are one half the cycle, the green arrows to the other half, and that charge of uh, motion is it's accumulating electrons out of the mass of the ground to make up the electrons it needs to create the amount of current that it has to create based on the voltage across the terminals and transmitter. So that's a schematic diagram of what it looks like when we're using the earth for a ground and uh, the current is flowing out of the ground through the transmitter or charge pump and into the antenna on half cycle and it's flowing out of the antenna through the charge pump and into the ground on the other half of the cycle. Okay, so now we go to the next situation and you see that the ground is vitally important because in this scenario the, the ground is part of the circuit and the capacitor between the antenna and the ground is part of the circuit. It's an active part of the circuit. So now we go to the next one. And um, uh, here I've drawn it as a schematic. And we've got an inductor with a capacitor across it, an inductor with a capacitor across it, an inductor with a capacitor across it, and of course this is the end of the antenna here. And uh, for half the cycle, what's happening is we're pulling uh, 
electrons out of the ground. They're going up like that, and uh, and then we're this we're charging this capacitor, this area between the antenna and the ground with electrons. So the electron path is going this way, and it's going it's returning through here. And actually, what it's doing is it's piling up up there because. Actually, I've drawn it like a separate capacitor, but th this plate is really up here. This plate is really down on the ground. So we're pulling the electrons to these locations, but in actuality, they end up all moving through these inductors down to the end. And each one of these tuned circuits acts like a delay network, and the total delay is the amount of time it takes the electrons to move clear down to the antenna and stop. But that's what the circuit looks like if you were to draw it. And so now, we go to the next antenna, and um, uh, this guy, and we've got a, that's a center-fed dipole, which is the most popular amateur antenna of all, is a center-fed dipole. There are a number of reasons for that. The ARL figured out a long time ago the biggest problem that amateur radio operators had and have today is getting a, a good earth ground. It's the hardest problem to solve. In some areas, they don't even have access to the ground. If you go back and look at some old ARL QST magazines and back in the Spark and Arc days and the early radio days, and it'll show some guy, and he's got an apartment on the roof of some building in the Bronx, right? And he's got his antenna up on the roof, and you look down, and what's he got underneath it? He's got a counterpoise. And that counterpoise is a substitute for having a ground. And he did, because he was too far above ground, the ground would have been part of the antenna. And so he had um, a counterpoise on the roof or something. And that was his ground. So here, you know, with this antenna, uh, we don't need the earth. The earth is now superfluous because we can, we have the capacitance coupling between the ends of the antenna. And even if the earth isn't here, we go out into space, the current's going to flow through uh, these coils, the uh, co antenna, through the charge pump out to the other end, and we deplete charge over here, and um, it gets high positive, we charge, build up a bunch of charge over here, it gets high negative. And then on the other half the cycle goes the other way. So when you're using a center fed antenna, which I did for years, I didn't even ground the, my rig, didn't ground it at all. I just plugged it into the wall, because in reality, this antenna really doesn't need a ground. It's making its own ground because of the capacity across the antenna elements like this. And that's completing the circuit. And um, a lot of people kind of disagree with that, but anyway, that's the way it is. Now the last antenna we can talk about here, or the next antenna, uh, this is a folded dipole. And a lot of you old timers got your start using a folded dipole uh, made out of 300 ohm twin leads or something like that. And uh, uh, they even, in fact, uh, uh, amp, amp, uh, Amperex, oh, is it Amperex? One uh, cable manufacturer came out with a dipole kit and there was this uh, um, twin lead that was about this big and probably like, uh, what, 400 ohm or something. And they put in two waves on the end, a little funnel-like block in the middle, and they put 300 ohm twin lead on that, and went down, you had simple link coupling in your transmitter, and he's shaking his head there, he knows. So anyway, in this case, uh, we have essentially four quarter waves. They're all in series. Well, if you put four resistors in series, what happens? If they're all the same value, you get four times the resistance, right? With the, the dipole, just the, uh, 
like a simple dipole, center fed, in peaks in the center, and due to the radiation resistance of each side, contributes 35 ohms of radiation resistance, so the impedance of the center of the antenna is 70 ohms. Now if you do this, it transforms that impedance at the center to 280 ohms. That's how you can use 300 ohm coax in the center to match this thing. And, uh, and there's still a good antenna. They're act actually, their act operation is kind of hard to understand because the current goes this way, okay, and what happens to the current here? If the current went this way, uh, wouldn't the, the current go this way and the current going this way cancel the magnetic field? I don't know the answer to that one. But this antenna does work and there's a schematic for it. And it is actually coupled to the earth, but the thing about it is, uh, there's no, it doesn't have to couple to the center of the feed line. It's just uh, the earth is changing the frequency of this antenna by proximity as a result of being coupled to the ground. It's uh, reducing the frequency of this antenna for a given amount of uh, length of the wire. So now, we'll move on to the next uh, antenna. And the next antenna is uh, popularly used is a quarter wave antenna. And it's coax, hook to coax, and the coax goes off to your transmitter or your, your antenna matcher or whatever it is. Nowadays they like to put a ballon in there because they want to balance the current uh, uh, flowing in the coax because it's a, it's a um, uh, asymmetrical uh, current distribution, but actually, um, and if you use 70 ohm coax and uh, your elements are like this, or you can actually, um, I'm sorry, use uh, like 50 ohm coax, the impedance of this quarter wave vertical is ordinarily about 35 ohms. It's half of a, what would be a folded dipole, so it's 35 ohms. So, uh, uh, unless you do something, you get an impedance mismatch to 50 ohms. It's 35 over 50, right? But actually, I figured out how to get around that, and I just detune the antenna a little bit and get uh, 15 ohms of reactance, like capacitive reactance, and the antenna uh, can't tell the difference. The, the transmission line can't tell the difference. Now I have an impedance of 50 ohms, I get my uh, one to one SWR, and the only problem is the resonant frequency of the antenna is offset a little bit from where it's tuned to frequency wise, but it isn't much. It's, it's just a you know a kilocycle or so. It's not a big deal. All right, so here's our vertical antenna, and you notice the current distribution: maximum at the bottom, zero at the top. Okay, well. What happens if we go over and we put a wire across the top here, we've got our vertical, we solder it onto that wire, we've got some insulators on each end, and now this wire here acts like a capacitor plate. And so the current goes up and it flows clear out to the end. So we just flow this direction on this side, is flowing this direction on that side. So actually the current is flowing in opposite directions away from this junction at the center. Okay? And because it adds to the capacitance and in, in parallel with the capacity to ground of this antenna, as you saw before, we had this invisible field of capacitance to ground, it actually reduces the frequency of this antenna from being a quarter wave down to something way less than that. <laughs> and so, um, back in the early days of radio, I'm going to take a little short detour here, um, there was a man came along by the name of Hertz, and he had the work that had been done by James Clerk Maxwell, and he was trying to 
to develop a unified field theory for electron for elect electricity and magnetism because it had been discovered that a current made magnetic fields, magnetic fields made electricity, and they had already hooked a coil across a Leyden jar, which was a capacitor, and got an oscillation out of it. So they already knew about oscillatory electric waves. And so here comes uh, James Cook Maxwell, and he's trying to take all these equations that are showing up and integrate them into a, a composite field of electronics. And he was able to do that, and he came up with a series of equations, actually, uh, that had been developed by other people, by Faraday and Ampere and, and uh, some of the other guys, and uh, uh, Bion Savar and whatnot. And he discovered in his equations, the solution to his equations, there was one equation that was what was called a traveling wave solution. And that indicated that there was such a thing as a radio wave. And so radio waves were discovered on paper before they were discovered in the physical world. And he published all his results and everything. People tried for about, oh, 20 years to uh, generate a radio wave. First guy to do it was Hertz, and he did it. And he was able to, uh, Heinrich Hertz, was able to generate radio waves at different frequencies. Most of his work was done at around 100 megacycles or more. And he discovered parabolic reflectors and all kinds of stuff, right? This guy is amazing. Anyway, so now another guy comes along and his name is Marconi. And people have been messing around with these radio waves. And he thought, boy, you know, if we could send these radio waves through space, we could communicate across vast distances. And so uh, they, uh, there was another guy who had discovered a way of detecting these waves. Hertz had a receiver that was a, a loop of wire with a little, little gap on it. And when he made a radio wave, it produced a spark in that little gap. But that wasn't a very good way to do it. Somebody else came up with a detector that caused particles of metal in a glass tube to coalesce together. I'm sure you've seen the situation where you, uh, it was a real cold, dry day, you know, and uh, you took a dish, dishcloth or something, and you picked it up and had a little streamer of dust hanging on it. You've seen that one. And all those particles are being held together by the electrostatic field. And so somebody said, you know, I could use that to detect a radio wave. And he built a thing called a coherer, which was two silver terminals and a glass tube with uh, silver particles between it. When you put a radio signal across it, they all co coalesce together, close the circuit, and would ring a bell. All right, now, we had the bell clapper clap the glass and break up the filings. And then if the radio was still there, they would close the, the clapper again, you know. And they made a receiver doing that. And they could, they could receive Morse code that was sent on this transmitter. All right, so now, here comes, here comes uh, Marconi. And he's trying to use that phenomenon to transmit signals. And he discovered if he put a wire on his receiver and a wire on his transmitter, he could transmit more than 50 feet. So he lengthened the wires, and he could transmit farther. And he lengthened the wires. He discovered ground. If he grounded one end of the wire and had the, the transmitter between ground and his wire, his antenna, the word antenna was first used to describe the little probes that stick out of the heads of bugs. You know, they wave them around in the air, and they don't have good uh, depth perception. They're using them to feel things in front of them. That's an antenna. And that term got put into radio because it was, and it fit for the name of this wire. So he used the word antenna, right? Biological words. So that's how we got the name for an antenna. Anyway, he found that as he made these wires longer, he got across distances of miles, hundreds of miles. The wires got longer, he could transmit farther. He finally was able to transmit from 
uh, from British, you know, the British Islands clear to Nova Scotia, right? You sent the letter S, you know? Anyway, so the idea was, oh, antenna's got to be huge. You know, it's got to be long to gather all this in its energy. Actually, what he was dealing with, we have a modern term for that. We call it aperture. All right, now you guys are into optics. You know that a big lens gathers more light than a small lens. It has more aperture, right? And so a big antenna gathers more signal than a small antenna because it has more aperture. And what he was doing was he was using aperture to make up for the fact that his receivers were really insensitive. Very poor receiver. But he actually made it work. But what he ended up with was, in the case of the uh, Titanic, they had two masts on the Titanic that were almost on opposite ends with a wire stretched between them for that wire and a Virgo running up to him that was about 100 feet high or so, 200 feet. And that was transmitting on about two or 300 kilocycles, clear down in VLF. So all the radio moved down into VLF because they needed big antennas to get from A to B. And so Marconi developed this T antenna. And they used it aboard ship on the navies, the British Navy and all the uh, commercial vehicles. And you can go look at all those old ship, steamship pictures and they all got T antennas. And most of the time, what they've got is they'll have a number of wires up here in series connected together at the center to increase the amount of capacity to ground to get this part to resonate at some low frequency. And, um, and they used them for a long time, and they kind of went out of vogue. And uh, finally, the only place that uh, anybody was using them was on low-frequency uh, NDBs, non-directional homing beacons, that were sending navigation signals to aircraft. And that system is still in place, although they're starting to abandon it. Well, I got interested in T antennas because I was involved in aviation for a long time. I used to use those deep beacons to navigate my way around the country at night in bad weather. So I decided, well, why not try them on the hand bands? So I built one, and uh, I discovered that most of what was written in the literature was about using on very, very low frequency. And as a result of that, there was a lot of the, the use of these antennas on high frequencies that never really been developed. Nobody had ever played with them much up there. And so there weren't any equations that enabled me to calculate the size of the antenna for a given resonant frequency. I just had to go out and I put up a wire between uh, two insulators and hooked a wire to it and put it down to the ground. And I put a ground rod in the ground, a little plate of metal, and an insulator to hold this on the bottom end, and a coax connector to hook it to my um, transmitter or my, uh, oh my god, I should turn this on. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, and I started playing with them and I adjusted the length of this wire here till I got it into the 40 meter band. And to begin with, this wire was 27 feet long, this wire was 8 feet high, and I just built it. I don't know where it's going to be. I'll get to my analyzer, it'll tell me, right? And uh, lo and behold, it was on 9.5 megacycles. So then I added a piece. And uh, to make a long story short, I ended up with 12 feet of wire here, 27 feet of wire there, put me in the 40 meter band with an SWR 101. <laughs> and I started using that antenna. And, um, and I was kind of busy. And uh, the night after I put that antenna up and got it tuned up, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. And uh, so I lit off my rig and had a little 15 watt homebrew tube transmitter on 40 meter CW. And the band was dinner to macro and everybody was snoring in their beds. And so uh, I called CQ. This guy comes back from Australia. I talked to this guy in Australia for half an hour on 40 meters and 15 watts. 
at 4.30 in the morning. I guess I'm getting out. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I discovered these antennas had superior performance. They were quieter than a vertical. They were quieter than a horizontal antenna. And uh, I was getting really good signal reports with them. So I built another one for uh, 30 meters. And that one was shorter. Uh, that one is only about 8 feet high and uh, 27 feet wide. And then I built one for uh, 80 meters. And this, this part became 24 feet. And I, had, I used four wires 27 feet long, spaced six inches apart across the top. I had a couple, a spreader at each end. And there were four wires connected to the center. And this part here was uh, 24 feet to a ground rod. And um, so anyway, um, that's, the, that's where it goes. And of course, it ended up, um, um, that's where I got involved with uh, the next uh, photo there. Um, I got involved with this little guy. I made one of those as an antenna simulator. And I used this, built this antenna simulator to demonstrate to you that this circuit behaves the same as an antenna does, and that's what this demonstration was about. So uh, um, that's the end of the that part of it. And now, if he goes beyond that, I've got a bunch of pictures of the antennas. I uh, kind of wanted to show you. Oh, I want to show you this. Go oh, back there. There, there. That one. This is a map that uh, I think Phil UGO gave us when he, taught, he did his talk on antenna grounding. And uh, if you look at this map, now, uh, let's see now, this funny little looking state here, that's called Oklahoma. I guess you know some people live there. And uh, right in the center of Oklahoma is right in here where we are, and the number is 30. <laughs> and there's an area in there, if you, if you scan all the way around the map, uh, there isn't a number higher than 30 anywhere on the map for soil conductivity. And that's, that, that's where we live, basically in this area here. And um, so I thought you might kind of like to see what that chart looks like. Because we're in an area, and I wondered why ground rods I've been using for counterpoise as opposed to ground radio systems, and they work fine for me. And so uh, that apparently is why. And now we got some pictures of, uh, of uh, well, that's just a basic antenna. Um, yeah, I can just go. Uh, uh, oh, all right. Well, actually, all right. Back up a little bit. I just want to go through this part real fast. Back up uh, a couple more. There it is. So here is uh, this uh, your basic T antenna. This is a. Uh, an insulator right here. These are insulators, these blobby guys. Wire stretch between it, hooked to a vertical, hooked to the coax, hooked to some kind of ground or ground poise or ground radial system or whatever you're using. And um, my goal is to develop the equations that enable you to calculate for a given length of horizontal wire and a given length of vertical wire what the resonant frequency of that antenna will be. And I haven't had a chance to finish that work. It's still in progress to get the equations and the coefficients. So now the schematic diagram for a T antenna is an inductor and these capacitors to ground. Okay? And so because of the unique properties of a T antenna, I can say, all right, uh, this is the inductor, that's the capacitance. So if I measure the capacitance of this wire to ground, and I can measure the inductance of this wire, I, I'll be able to come up with equations that enable me to uh, calculate the resonant frequency of, for, of a given array, or backwards, given a, a desired frequency, I can, for a given height, I can calculate how long this wire has to be. And that's where this whole project is going. So here's your basic antenna, vertical antenna, um, T antenna, dipole, I don't care what it is. 
there's a circuit for your antenna in terms of uh, uh, radio components. And uh, go back one more time. Uh, we got L, we got C, and a resonant frequency equation is given a certain amount of capacitance, given a certain amount of inductance. The frequency is uh, uh, given by the relationship 2 pi times the square root of the uh, inductance in Henry's times the capacity in Farad's <coughs> and give you the resonant frequency of the antenna. That's the equation I'm looking for for a T antenna because it doesn't obey that completely. It, it obeys a different equation. So we need a new equation. So go to the next one. All right. Here is the, in a series resonance circuit, the two reactances are opposite. The reactance of, of the inductor, let's say it's positive. The reactance of the capacitor is negative. You add those two reactances together, you get zero, okay? And, uh, and so here's the equation here for uh, inductive reactance. All right, now what is reactance? Let's talk about that for a minute because a lot of people get hung up on that word. So let's take a situation, uh, any, any situation in your life, you can pick one. And you know, if you think about your life, your, your life is broken into two sections. You know, there's the impact your environment has on you and your reaction to that impact. You know, something happens, you react to it, okay? You know, if uh, somebody punches you in the nose, maybe you punch him back, right? That's your reaction. And so, and there's a reaction to everything that happens. Well, in radio, they use that word reaction to explain what that reaction is. In the case of an inductor, if you, uh, if you run a, try to run a current through a wire, the inductor attempts to back that current to prevent it from happening. If you try to charge a capacitor, the charge in the capacitor tries to prevent you from increasing that charge. And it's, the reactance is always bucking something. It's like if uh, the Russians invaded the United States, our reaction would be to push them out, right? That's reactance. And it's the same way in radio. So reactance, inductive reactance is the attempt to reduce a, the rate of change of a current, to change, reduce a current. Or if I take the current off, the field collapses, then it generates a real high voltage across the ends of the wire. That's called reactance. Well, the, the, the effect produced by a capacitor and the effect produced by an inductor are opposite. And when you put those two opposites together, you create a situation that is oscillatory. Now I'll give you another example. If I was to take and put a hook up here on the ceiling and a piece of string, and I get down here and I take a big old, um, you know, uh, weight uh, uh, for uh, like fishing weight, you know, you put on the end of a fish line, and I hold it out here and I let it go, and it's going to go over like this, and then it's going to go like this, and then it's going to go like this, and it's going to go like this. And when it's up here, it has potential energy. And it starts to fall, only the string makes it go over here. And when it gets down to the bottom, it's got velocity, kinetic energy, but it doesn't have much potential energy. But the kinetic energy carries it up over here. And then that kinetic energy gets transformed to potential energy, and it starts to fall again, and it swings back over here. And it oscillates. And that's what a radio circuit does with inductance and capacity. It's the same thing. The, the current going through the induct induced by the collapsing field and the inductor creates the current flow of the wire that charges the capacitor one way. And then as that charge builds up, it bucks the flow of current from the inductor. And pretty soon the capacitor starts to discharge the wire. And the next thing you know, the electrons are going to the other, in the other end of the other plate. 
and, uh, and so it oscillates back and forth. And the equation that describes that is that very first one we had, um, uh, go back uh, one notch, is this one right here. Describes that oscillation that occurs in the current in an LC circuit. That's what it gives you. And so if you got the equation for the inductive reactants, you got the equation for the capacitive reactants, you put the two together, now you got uh, one of them, here's uh, the capacitor equal to the inductor, and if I, if I put the 2 pi over there, and I get uh, FL 1 over 2 pi squared, and then I take the L and put over there, then I got, and the F over there, I got F squared over 2 pi LC, I take the square root of that, I got F equals the, um, I'm sorry, this should be, uh, should be a 4 here, 4 squared. I take the square root of that, why then I end up with uh, frequencies 1 over 2 pi a square root LC. And so there's the derivation of that equation for resonant frequency. So there has to be a derivation for that. And what I'm hoping to do is to come up with a derivation for the equation to describe the out properties of this TN10. Anyway, so that's the end of that. And now we can look at the antennas. So you can see this is the 30 meter antenna. That's eight feet. Oh, there's an insulator and it goes off the edge of the paper over here to my house. And it goes down to an insulator. And you can't see it in this picture, but I'll show you another one. And there's a, an insulator anchored to a metal plate. There's a coax connector on the metal plate. The metal plate is anchored to an eight foot ground rod. I hook my coax to it that goes off to the house. Now the one in the background, that's the 40 meter one. But I want to show you on the, the one in the foreground here, this is a 30 meter one, and that was uh, the original length, and I kept adding um, wire to it to get it to uh, resonate. It originally it was up around um, 13 megacycles, and so I added some wire. Well, it came down to like uh, 11 and a half or something. I added some more wire. I finally got it down into the, the 30 meter handband. And uh, same thing with the other one. That one goes over to uh, an insulator at this pole over here, and then it goes to uh, a different mast. Actually, and uh, so anyway, there's the two of them. The 80 meter one was taken down by the wind, so I couldn't really show you that one. And so go to another picture, and I think there's at least a, there's a center connection on the, the one for 30 meters. Um, oh, here it is. So you see, here's the 30 meter, here's the insulator. There's a hole in the plate that holds the insulator. And then there's a wire from the coax connector goes up and connects right here to the end, vertical antenna. And then there's the eight foot ground rod. I made this little plate and I mount the clamp right on it and then I hook my coax on that and take it in the house. And uh, there's a few more pictures but they're all pretty much the same. You can see it's just wound up there and soldered. I use a propane torch. Here's the Another view of it, you can see the coax goes in the house from the uh, 30 meter, and actually this is the 40 meter antenna here. And there's the middle plate and all that good stuff. And so there's the other uh, end of the, you can see the 30 meter antenna goes up like that, you know. And uh, there's a different support for the other end of the uh, 40 meter antenna. You can also see in that picture, if you look carefully, there's a wire running across here. Right, you see it right there? Well, that's my, uh, it goes out to this pole here, that's my 80 meter in-fed antenna. Then I use the corner wave on uh, 160 meters. And you can see it uh, going out there. So anyway, that's the story on that. And there's my house, and you can see what I, I got to get busy. <laughs> but um, anyway, there it is. What was that first contact? Yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. You did. Question.
Service to my house, obviously. Yeah, I saw the electrical line yeah. back to the pole, and you're in in phase with that. I didn't know if you had any inducting. I don't know. If it, I don't know what effect it's having, but I haven't noticed anything detrimental from it. Okay. You know, I I don't have the best antenna location, but I got to use what I got. You know. Well, it just it just seemed like because they were running parallel. It would act like an inductive field. Well, it it probably does. You know, it probably does. It probably affects the radiation pattern for one thing. Yeah. You know, but I seem to talk to everybody I call. You know, sometimes I don't have good receptor reports. Sometimes I do. You know, and uh, I don't know. It's the vertical. These two T antennas uh, on the whole. I think perform a lot better than my other antennas. You know, and I even consider taking a lot of the other ones down because these work better. They're certainly they're quieter, the noise figure is much better. And the other thing I want to mention about them before I forget is that uh, uh, we were talking about aperture before, and I think the reason these antennas are very are much better receiving antennas than my other antennas is this top wire across here spreads out the electrostatic field to the ground and so in effect they have more aperture because the signals are noticeably stronger on the T antennas than they are in my other verticals or wire antennas. It's noticeable. Conrad, you, yeah. said, you said the top wire was 27 feet. Uh, on all of them, is is there something special about 27 feet, or is that just well, what you have to on the have? 80, on the um, on the the 10 megacycle one, the 30 meter one, it's only 17 feet. Oh, okay. It's That's 17 and 8, and the 40 is uh, 27 and uh, 12, and then I I just uh, thought, well, uh, when I got around to building the 80 meter antenna, and I thought to myself, well. That's half the frequency, so to double the capacity, you know, you actually, yeah, it's, you know, you need four times the capacity to have the frequency, so I went to four 27-foot wires, and then I doubled the, I increased the length of the vertical section, but that, that was the only, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, you know, rationale for what I did, you know, but basically, you know, uh, and then Bill Baker, uh, we mailed some for two meters. In fact, you saw one of them work at the last club meeting. He brought one in and he built on a cigar box. Uh, we wheeled on a cigar box for two meters and it was about this high and about this wide. So it was shorter than a quarter away for two meters. And uh, they seemed to work okay up there too. You know, the, as an as a antenna for, um, you know, how do you evaluate an antenna for whether or not you're going to use it? The reason I was interested in these antennas was because, in a way, they're physically small. You know, in other words, um, a half-wave wire antenna for 40 meters without traps in it is uh, 60, what, 66 feet? It's uh, 33 feet for uh, 20 meters, it's uh, 135 feet for 80 meters, it's 240 feet for 160 meters, this sort of thing, 270 feet, whatever it is. Well, you know, and a vertical for uh, 40 meters, 33 feet, plus I got a loading coil, and uh, even 30 feet for uh, 10 megacycles, and that thing is 8 feet high. And so for people who live in in towns where they can't have antennas sticking up or a big stuff, they don't have a lot of room for horizontal antennas, uh, they can put up the antennas and get out like a bandit. And that's why I was interested in them more than anything. Because for like 40, 85 years of my life, I lived in apartments in cities. 
you know, and I was sneaking a little wire out the window, you know, to a tree or something. And uh, they'd take it down as soon as they saw it, this sort of thing. So being on the air was kind of a covert thing, you know. Yeah. Are there any other questions? You had a question, didn't you? You answered.